politics, business, and religion. We discuss the topics you avoid at the dinner table, bringing you the biggest names in Texas politics and beyond. This is The Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Trey Blocker Show. Today, we are honored indeed to have on the show Leah Carowin, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation. So, Leah, welcome to The Trey Blocker Show. Thank you, Trey. It's a privilege to be here with you. Now, since we're on Skype, tell us, tell us where, we're, where you are at today. I'm actually in our offices, our headquarters in Chesapeake, Virginia, here at the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation offices. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I didn't tell you this before the show, but I went to a little school in Virginia right in between Richmond and Lynchburg called Hamden Sydney College. Yes, very familiar with Hamden Sydney. That's great. Terrific college. Great school, great school. Certainly an experience I wouldn't trade for the world. And I always tell folks, William F. Buckley actually called Hamden Sydney the most conservative college in the nation. So that's a little known fact that I'm always proud of and proud to share with folks. But so, Leah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where were you born and raised? I was actually born and raised in Seattle. Well, I was born in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, wow. I made my way down at two years old with my family uh, to Seattle, Washington. And I was raised in a little town outside of Seattle in Normandy Park. Washington most of my life and then uh, came to went to the University of Washington uh, business school then came to Regent University to go to grad school out here in Virginia Beach great met my husband here Rolf and we got married had a couple kids but then we actually moved back to Seattle for 15 years and raised our kids there with near my family which was a real joy because my husband traveled so much it was he, he really felt like he wanted me to have the support in raising the kids, so we did that. Sure. And then about 10 years ago, we moved back to Virginia Beach area and Chesapeake Hampton Roads area. Okay, okay. So Seattle, Washington, home of Starbucks and home of the gum wall. Is that still there? Oh, yes. <laughs> in fact, we had a family reunion there, and that was one of the things we had to do is take everybody to the gum wall. My uh, my in-laws, my, my son-in-law and daughter-in-law had never seen the gum wall. Right. So for, for, for uh, those in my audience who have never been to Seattle, t- tell us what the gum wall is. Well, that's a huge wall at uh, outside of Pike Place Market, downtown Seattle, where people come and, and stick their gum. Of course, pe- pretty plenty of graffiti and other things on that wall now besides sure. just gum. But you chew your gum, you stick it on the wall. It, it is it is a sight to behold. It, it's a little disgusting, I have to admit. <laughs> so how, how did that ever get started, do you know? I haven't the foggiest idea. Well, I, I thought I'd recalled seeing a story not long after I had been in Seattle a couple of years ago where the, somebody had decided, I guess maybe with the city, that they were going to clean the gum wall, and there was almost a riot. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. that's an icon there. It, it really is. And, and it is a little bit disgusting, but it's interesting to see um, if you're ever in Seattle. So you got a master's degree in Christian theology. Tell us what uh, motivated you to get that degree. Well, honestly, I felt like it was my faith and walking with the Lord was the most important thing in my life. And so I wasn't intending to make a career of any kind of a, a religious um Uh, you know, pastor or any kind of ministry as a career. But I just felt like if this is the thing that's most important to me, I'd like to study more. I'd like to really learn what I really wanted to know the Bible. I wanted to understand it. And I picked a a university that I felt really uh, would teach me to fall in love with the Word of God and the Bible and being a follower of Jesus. And that's exactly what I got at Regent University. Absolutely. It's It's a great school. So what did you think you, you wanted to do with that, if anything, or you just wanted the education for, for the sake of it? Yeah, just for the sake of it, honestly. I went to business school, because I, and, and that was sort of the same, same philosophy, is what's the best uh, degree that I can get in undergrad that would most set me up to be able to go in multiple directions, and that was my business degree. And then what's the one that will set me up in life to actually live a woman who is a woman of character and of faith, and that sure. was the theology degree. Well, that's great. So, so what did you do after that? After that, actually, my husband and I started our own uh, business. My husband's a motivational speaker. He, okay. we now have been, he's been doing that for nearly 20 years. I ran his office. 
Uh, we started a consulting group uh, all around the, the things, the elements that he was teaching about from the platform, had multiple clients, multiple consultants, and then uh, did that for many years until I became the director of the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation. So tell us a little bit about the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation and how the actual caucus got founded and then how the foundation got founded and the, the difference between the two. Yeah, the caucus was actually founded by Congressman Randy Forbes. Uh, he, it, it's, it's a great story because he uh, felt like the Lord asked him to begin praying in room 219, which is a strategic room right off the House floor before the, the members of Congress go into votes. And so he reserved this room for 30 minutes every single week. This was back in 2001 and invited his colleagues from both sides of the aisle to come and pray, pray for each other, pray for the nation. And they felt like that it, it just was the right thing to do and the crucial thing to do for the sake of our nation and for their relationships. And out of that room, uh, two room 219, what started there with just one man and then a few gentlemen actually has grown into now a room where they for years had nearly standing room only as they came together and prayed, they still pray in that room. And out of those relationships, they actually formed a bipartisan Congressional Prayer Caucus, which is an official U.S. House caucus okay. designed to ed promote prayer and to advance religious freedom and just to ensure that God continues to have a, a place in shaping America, America's future. Now, Leah, let me ask you a question right there for a second. I'm glad to hear you say that, that this is a bipartisan caucus because I think that's important. But at the same time, I... I I would suspect there are some folks in the country who are a little more left-leaning who may have listened to what you just said and say, whoa, 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 wait. Isn't that, isn't, doesn't that violate separation of church and state because they're praying in the nation's capital? What, what do you say to that? Well, I think they'd have to recognize history. Um, separation of church and state has been misapplied and, and used to, com as, has been completely turned on its head. What separation of church and state was designed to do that Thomas Jefferson himself said was to ensure that God did not interfere with our ability to live out our faith in the public square. But recently in the last decade or so, there's been a handful of people that have taken that phrase, hammered it over our heads and repeated over and over the fact that what it really means is that God should, has no place in government or no place in the public square, completely opposite of what it means, completely opposite of what the constitution says. And here's the thing people need to remember, the, the House, the Senate, every single state legislature opens in prayer every single time they right. meet. They used to have a church in the, that met in the, at the Capitol. I mean, there is no, no even concept of the fact that God doesn't belong in government and, neither, and prayer doesn't belong in government. That is, that is a complete falsehood that if you bought into that, you probably bought into what uh, anti-faith and anti-God rhetoric. That's just not true. That's right. Well, Leah, on my, on my Trey Blocker Show Facebook page every Sunday, we post a quote uh, that's religious in nature from one of our founding fathers. And we started this exercise because it's become abundantly clear to me that the majority, well, a lot of people in the country believe that separation in church and state is something that is in the Constitution, which you and I know it's not, and, and they've misinterpreted what Thomas Jefferson meant by it, and they're using it to completely push God and religion and Christ out of the public square. So we've started this weekly post from a founding father to try to educate folks on what the actual history of our nation is and that our country was founded uh, by Christians on Judeo-Christian principles, and they intended for this to be a Christian nation. That's right, exactly. And it's not some false concept that everybody in this nation needs to be a Christian, should be a Christian, or that right. they would force people to be a Christian. Right. It simply means, a Christian nation simply means that our laws and policies will reflect Judeo-Christian or biblical values and concepts. And what people really need to remember is that two very, very important things that our founders understood, and what is you must protect religious freedom for everybody, every religion and faith or non-faith. You must protect everybody's religious freedom. Even God protects the freedom of conscience, and so must we. That is a God-given right. 
And at the same time, every group of people that come together in, to form any kind of community, but especially a nation, they will come together and agree upon a certain set of values and principles in which they will live by. And the founders of this nation, the leaders for centuries of this nation have said there's only one set of principles and values that will pro protect everybody's religious freedom and that will continue to create the environment in which we can have remain a free republic. The only set of principles are the Judeo-Christian principles. And all you have to do is look around the, the world and you'll see that the, the place in which people know that your religious freedom will be protected is in America, okay. except for the fact that now with the anti-God, anti-faith agenda and, and just a small minority of people, they're trying to change that. They're trying to take God out of the country. And it, and that's a, that you, you, can't, you cannot take faith out of the country and expect to remain a free country. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I realized a, a couple of years ago that Christianity is definitely under attack in America and I always point to the example of the baker in Colorado who was fined and forced to go to sensitivity training because he refused to bake a cake for a same-sex couple. And, and that case has now made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it very well could end up being a seminal case for religious freedom and freedom of expression in this country. But uh, that's just one example. Uh, can you give us another example or other examples uh, demonstrating this attack on, on religion and Christianity in this country? Yeah, there are so many to choose from. I The, the ones that come to mind is the seven-year-old in California that was told they cannot read the verses in that the, his mother sent to, in his lunchbox to school, even though his his classmates, it was at lunchtime, even though his classmates wanted him to read the Bible verses, the encouraging things that his mom used to send every day, not only did that seven-year-old get told, you cannot read those, got called down to the principal's office and said, don't ever bring those, a sheriff was sent to the child's home to warn the parents that they cannot send Bible verses to school with the seven-year-old. Oh, wow. What about the coach in Washington state that was told you cannot go out into the middle of the field after a football game and bow the knee and pray for your players and thank God that everybody was safe, your players and the opposing team. That's not allowed. You cannot actually go out there. And, and what about the uh, fire chief? Well, hold on a second, fired? Leah. I mean, what, what, what point have we come to in our country where it's okay to take a knee at a football game to protest the flag of our great country, but it's not okay to take a knee in prayer? Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to really imagine. And here's the thing, Trey, most Americans absolutely believe, just like you and I do, that that's just not right. right. There's just a small percentage of people, anti-faith people who are pushing this agenda and the challenge is, is they're aggressive, they're they're well funded, and they're serious about this because they have they have a, an agenda at the end of this. Right. And if the average American, if people like you and me don't stand up and say, wait a minute, we're not putting up with that, they're having their way. The momentum is shifting because they are so aggressive and so intentional and very strategic. And on our side, we have to get serious. Absolutely. And I know that you are doing that uh, with the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation. So share with our audience uh, a little more about its mission and what you guys are up to today. Right. The Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation is actually a separate entity from the caucus. We're a nonprofit organization, and we have the same mission and values as, as, the, as the caucus. We believe in advancing uh, faith in America and and what we've done is we have actually built the largest network of government leaders across the nation. Now the 100 members in Congress are part of the Congressional Prayer Caucus. Plus we have nearly 1,000 state legislators in over 30 states who have committed to standing for faith and impacting the culture and ensuring that God and prayer and biblical concepts have a place in shaping America's future. And so this network of government leaders have and that is our is what we do at the foundation is we support them, equip them, help them, and we just find ways in which they can unite and work together. Sure. So if I'm listening to this show and I'm in Dallas, Texas, or I'm in Richmond, Virginia, 
Uh, what can I do to help you in your mission? One of the things that we would love for you to do is, is on, if you wanted to go to the website, cpcfoundation.com, okay. you can find out what's happening in your state. We do have a legislative prayer caucus in Texas. We have a legislative prayer caucus in Virginia. And we also have state directors in the state. And here's what they're doing. They are uh, working with our legislators to say, how can we best support you? Here's what ended up happening, Trey, when we went around the nation and began to um, unite these government leaders and encourage them. We said to them, what is it that we can do to stand with you, to hold up your arms? You're on the front lines to trying to defend our religious freedom and advance prayer and God in this nation. Right. What can we do? And you know what their, one of their first things is, they said? They said, could you, could you encourage the church to stand with mm -hmm. us? We cannot do this alone. We cannot, we, are, we are, don't have the ability to stand on our own. They must be praying with us. They must be showing up. Right. And at the committee meetings, they must be calling us. They, may, they need to be speaking out that they support what we're doing because we only hear from the church when they don't like what, we, what we're doing. Hmm. And if we, are, if we only hear from the church when they're upset, we cannot win the battle for faith in God in America. We will not be able to continue to remain a free and republic in which faith is welcome here. All right. Well, unfortunately, over over the past decade or so, churches have been shamed to a large degree into thinking that they can't engage uh, in with what's going on in the political arena, that they have to remain silent. And that's not the case, is it? That is not the case. Another bullying tactic um, started with the Johnson Amendment, but then it's happened over and over. I mean, there's organizations that send letters, uh, 40,000 letters to pastors every time there's an election that says, make sure you don't say anything about this or you might lose your 501c3 status. And that's that's just not true either. Right. I mean, our pastors, our churches, it, here's the question you have to ask yourself if you're a pastor. If you're not talking about the things that the people are talking about around, around their kitchen tables at the water cooler, if you're not talking about the importance of faith in, in the public square, who is going to fill the heads of the Christians? And it's going to be the people that do not believe that faith has a place in America. It's going to, there's going to be a void of understanding because our schools are not teaching about it anymore. You're not going to hear it in the media anymore. You're not hearing it anywhere. So if you're not hearing in the churches, then you're going to have generations of people who, who completely lose the concept of the fact that it's a responsibility of the Christians to bring light and hope and bring the answers to the things that ail our nation. It's our responsibility to steward freedom well. Absolutely. And we both know it's an objective of the left to silence their opposition so that theirs is the only voice uh, that people are hearing and people are, are, are being affected by. Well, let me, let me describe four things that have happened. And honestly, I actually don't use the words left and right because they're so um, defined in people's minds because we have, we have Republicans and Democrats. We have right. people of all ethnicities and across party lines because the people that, here's the, here are the two sides of this. It's the people who believe that faith and God has a place in America's future and the people who do not. And there is a definite line there. They have two completely different agendas. So when I talk about the people that I'm that I'm going to refer to right now and, and the effects of what their their efforts are, it really is the people who believe that God and faith has no place in America or in his future. Right. And here are the four effects of their energies and their efforts that have taken place. And I think you'll recognize this. They have redefined Christianity in the last decade or so. It's no longer good to be a Christian in America. We're now the haters. We're now the ones that are causing the problems. We're, we, the other thing is, is that they have actually limited the, lo the places in which we can put forth the Christian message. So again, all the ways in which we used to provide a Christian message or a positive message about faith and God in America, no longer can talk about it, including in some churches, which is what we just talked about. Sure. And the third thing is, is they isolated Christian leaders. If a Christian leader stands up, especially in the government sphere, and tries to take a stand for faith, they swarm and take down that leader, and it causes a chilling effect, and they right. try to separate and divide the Christian leaders. And the fourth thing that they've done is that they've made it artificially costly to live out your faith in the public square. And I say artificially because 
there is a group of people who are who are applying bullying tactics by sending threatening letters and by pushing forward these lawsuits right. in in situations where the person has a, to a completely constitutional, the laws and policies are still on our side, but it's become so costly to live out your faith in the public square that it that it makes it difficult. So because of the, because of their efforts, those are four things that have happened in the last decade. And people are starting to realize, wow, we really do have a problem here. We need to stand up for our faith. Right. So, Leah, I opened up my Facebook a couple weeks ago and saw my good friend David Barton with Wall Builders uh, leading a discussion that was part of a nationwide conversation uh, called Keeping Faith in America that I think you had something to do with. So would you mind telling the audience about that and, and what you guys achieved there? Absolutely. Yes, there's a hub of organizations that came together and said, it's time for us to take a stand together, be proactive, be strategic. And the very first thing that came out of this planning session was operation called Keep Faith in America. And we now have, it's not only this hub of organizations that felt like it's, we had to stand up, but now there's nearly 50 organizations who have joined together. And this is across ethnicities, across theologies, across um, parties who have said, it's crucial right now, we have a window, we cannot back off, we must keep faith in America. And so what's happened is, is that there is a series, We it was launched on January 16th with, uh, through the government sphere, we had almost a thousand government leaders standing up at their state capitals in over 30 state capitals across America, wow. who, who took a stand for faith. They not only spoke about it, they gathered in prayer. They signed proclamations. We had numbers of governors, legislators signing resolutions, proclamations. And then just so that everybody could participate, because we know that there's a limited number of people that can go to these events. We actually did a Facebook live streaming event using my live app. Right. And we, and we, we had eight hours of live streaming and not only these thousand government leaders, but we had celebrities and and um, and faith leaders, notable people in multiple spheres that stood up together and said, we're all gonna stand together and keep faith in America. And that's just the beginning. We're now moving in February into the churches and providing over 100,000 churches with keep faith in America videos, real simple 90 second, really, I think, appealing vi uh, videos. And then in March, we're working with the universities and campus groups to, to put forth and give them discussion and start the conversation um, in, in April with schools. And then in May, uh, I'm sorry, in April, we're going to be working with our, our school boards and, and local businesses. And in the May, we're all joining together to advance the uh, National Day of Prayer, which is an actual National Day of Prayer that we should all be getting behind. So it's a it's a whole movement um, of, of keeping faith in America. That, that's absolutely incredible. And I know I, I enjoyed watching it on Facebook and, and was glad to see that you were doing that. You mentioned something a second ago that, that made me think uh, celebrities these days, uh, you know, we live in a celebrity culture uh, for good or bad, right? But we live in a celebrity culture and celebrities influence a lot of people, a lot of young people. And from my standpoint, a lot of times it's with messages that I don't agree with. Is there anything you're doing to identify Christian celebrities or celebrities who agree with the Keep Faith in America message, who, who can engage with you in this effort? Yes, absolutely. And there's so many people in so many areas of our culture that are willing to take a stand. They just are looking for ways in which they can stand together. So for example, in January, uh, Dr. Franklin Graham and uh, D uh, Dr. Jim Dobson, James Dobson, and uh, Dr. Ronnie Floyd from the Baptist, I mean, National Day of Prayer, there's a number of leaders that stood up together in January. Uh, Kevin and Sam Sorbo, they they stood up. Celebrities that were saying, let's not let's not shrink back. Let's be bold and 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 tell people that uh, we're not going to lay down on this thing. And then in uh, in in February, we have a number of pastors who are actually submitting videos and saying, I want to be a part of this, and I want to encourage our whole denomination. I want to encourage. Uh, we have uh, Sammy Rodriguez, who has a huge network of Hispanic churches, and sure. it's it's across ethnicities. And then and then in March, we're we're actually looking for the people who the young people, the university students. We went to a number of them and said, who 
who would you like to hear from? Who, who would you be influenced by? So we, we found about 10 or 15 people and we're reaching out to them and saying, would you put together a three or four minute video just to start the conversation, talk about what you believe and why it's important that we keep faith in America and pray for our leaders and, and take a stand and, and don't shrink back. And, and then uh, let, the, let the students talk about it in their, in their weekly um, campus meetings. And then um, again, we're, we're hoping that uh, people of influence will step up and use their influence to say, I stand for faith. Absolutely. Well, Leah, I appreciate everything that you're doing and, and wish you the best of luck. We're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. But uh, tell us again, if we want to support your efforts financially, where, where can we go and contribute? Well, a couple of different places. If you're interested in the Keep Faith in America, you can go to the keepfaithinamerica.com website and donate to, to this very important mission. Uh, we would love to have partners helping uh, Keep Faith in America Facebook page if you want to find out more about what's going on or, or watch the videos. And uh, the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation is one of a number of organizations. Of course, you can find out more about us at cpcfoundation.com. Okay. And if that is something that you want to uh, incur, you know, participate in and this network of government leaders and support their efforts, uh, please go to cpcfoundation.com and, and find out more about what we're doing. But again, we feel like the most important thing right now is that across the board, we unite, we work together, and that we ensure that uh, that we're not isolated, but that we actually, in a, with a united voice, uh, stand for faith in America. Absolutely. So, Leah, as you know, we like to end each episode of the Trey Blocker Show with a, a quote or a favorite Bible verse or song lyric from our guest. Any words of wisdom you would like to share with our audience today? Well, the verse that I struggle between a couple verses because I have a verse that is my personal life verse, which is delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust in him and he will do it. Um, that has meant so much to me all throughout my life because it really is just my eyes focused on the Lord and delighting in him and then letting him do whatever he wants to do with your life. And then, uh, and then the verse that the Lord gave me when I first launched the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation, when I first took over as the executive director, uh, he spoke very clearly to my heart through the verse that said, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. And I think I've seen him so faithfully uh, direct paths. And, and I think that's a, a voice for all, uh, a message for all of us is that this isn't about man's wisdom or about our wisdom or our strategies or what we can do, but it's all about what God can do. And so we need to look to the Lord, devote ourselves to praying and asking him for his wisdom, his guidance, because so, so much of today we're, we're divided and we're, um, we're, you know, not civil. And what we want to do is we want to create an environment where people understand that God loves them and wants right. to be a part of their lives. And that's the core message. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And Leah Carowin, Executive Director of the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation, thank you for coming on the Trey Blocker Show, and I hope you'll join us again sometime. Thank you, Trey. It really was a privilege being with you. Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please go to YouTube and subscribe or your favorite podcast app. And you can also find us at TreyBlockerShow.com. Thank you and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.